Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Westchester Education Services webinar, Supporting the Educational Needs of English Language Learners. My name is Nicole Tomasi, and I'm the Marketing and Conference Manager here at Westchester. And I'm joined today by Walter Henderson, Jr., who is the Senior Supervising Editor for ELT here at Westchester Education Services. And just a little background about the reason why we're doing today's webinar. Um, it actually um, originated out of the fact that we were not able to attend the TESOL convention this past March in Denver due to the ongoing situation um, with the coronavirus. And we thought that this would be um, another great way to reach out to all of the people in this community to share some resources and information about how to support English language learners during this time. So I'm really looking forward to um, what our panelists are going to be sharing with us. And uh, before I introduce them, I just want to cover some, you know, simple housekeeping measures, if you will, uh, just to let the attendees know that your microphones are going to be muted for the duration of the webinar. But I do invite you to enter any questions that you have during the presentation in the lower portion of the question and answer box that's accessible from your control bar. We will answer questions at the end of the discussion and we will get to as many as we can during the time we have remaining at the end of the session. But for any questions that we don't have an opportunity to answer live, we will get you those answers after the conclusion of the webinar. Um, and it turns out that this isn't indeed a very timely topic. Um, this article was in the Education Week website this morning about the ways that um, staff are trying to keep connected with their English language learners um, while schools are closed during the coronavirus epidemic. So it, I'm glad that we're able to bring this to you today. And with that, let me give you some background on who Westchester is in case you're not familiar with us. Westchester, Westchester Education Services is a division of employee-owned Westchester Publishing Services and is headquartered in Dayton, Ohio, with additional resources throughout the United States, Europe, and a small team that's based in Noida, India. And what Westchester Education Services does is provide development services, including content development, art and design, and production services that can either be um, purchased as a full service package or can be individually selected based upon the project specific needs. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists and give you a little bit of background about each of them, starting with Allison Camacho, who is the Associate Director of the Language Studio at the Savannah College of Art and Design. Allison has been in English as a Second Language and English as a Foreign Language Teaching and Program Administration since 1998. And in addition to teaching ESL, EFL, she has worked as a teacher trainer and program coordinator with teachers from multiple countries, including Egypt, Mexico, Brazil, Iraq, Korea, Nicaragua, and China. Next is Andy Cowell, ELT consultant and trainer with ELT Connections. Andy's been in ELT publishing and training for 30 years, having worked in over 40 countries. He's very passionate about creative ELT materials and motivating teaching professionals. Andy's also known for his enthusiastic and practical talks that encourage teachers to try new ideas and connect language learning with the real world. Last but not least is Chris Hastings, the ESL coordinator for Southwest Tennessee Community College. Chris has spent the last 18 years teaching English as a second language and English as a foreign language, as well as training English teachers. He's a member of the TESOL International Association's Board of Directors with a term that runs through 2023. Prior to returning home to Memphis, he worked for the U.S. State Department English Language Program in St. Petersburg, Russia and Guangzhou, China. And he has also lived and taught in Colombia, Brazil, South Korea and Saudi Arabia. Welcome all. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. You're welcome. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Walter to begin our discussion. Okay, great, great. Well, we, why are we meeting today? I, I think that uh, Nicole covered uh, the main sort of uh, things that we were thinking about. And as we all know, most students and teachers around the world are not in the uh, schools, uh, but they are continuing their lessons outside of the classroom. And this means English language learners as well. 
And there are an abundance of resources online for us to use, um, but sometimes it's difficult to wade through them all. And um, a lot do seem to be related to covering topics such as English grammar skills. Um, but basically this is an opportunity for us to point out a few of our personal favorites. And we do this in hopes of encouraging both students and teachers to turn more to online resources to supplement uh, their language learning and, and teaching. Some of the key topics that we'll be talking about are, we'll be looking at what school areas are the most underrepresented in online ELT environments. Uh, we'll be looking at which skill area of English language learning personally interests you, the panelists, the most and why. And we'll be looking for you to answer what is your go-to or favorite ELT website and what school area does it address. And um, also we'd like to know, we'd be very interested in finding out what type of user it, is this online tool most, tool most suitable for. Okay. So I will, let's start off with, um, with uh, Allison. Um, Allison Camacho, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to, um, to be with you again. Allison has been a colleague of mine for many, many years, and we're very interested in hearing your, your, your take on this um, and learning more about uh, your institution and what you do um, for the students that you have there. Sure, thank you for having me, Walter. Um, so I am the Associate Director of the Language Studio at Savannah College of Art and Design, um, or most well known as SCAD. Um, and in my role, um, I primarily oversee faculty um, as they teach students in the ESL program. Um, I also still teach um, a few classes per year. I don't wanna lose that skill um, while I'm in the administrator's role. Um, and I honestly, I miss being in the classroom. Um, but primarily, I am overseeing faculty there, um, and our program is a um, six-level program, um, a pathway program, so the students at the levels five and six actually take um, art and design classes and studio classes at the same time as they are still in the ESL program. Okay, okay. Well, great, great. Well, if you, what, what can you tell us about the, the students that attend SCAD? Are they pretty diverse? Is it a pretty diverse, diverse uh, ELT student population? I imagine they come from all over the world. Um, the international students population at SCAD, there are over a hundred different countries, so it is really quite diverse. Um, in the ESL program, um, we primarily have students from China and Korea. Um, so the ESL program is not quite as diverse as um, the SCAD degree programs, um, but um, we do, you know, have a pretty wide variety of students from many different countries. Okay, okay. And as far as online resources that, that you use or that you might uh, suggest that teachers in the program use or, you know, your own students or what have you, are they related to the study of art and design or is it more school-based? Um, and what is your favorite? <laughs> I know we'll get to that, but uh, yes. Um, so um, we're very fortunate um, in, at my institution to have students who are so incredibly creative. Um, they always think outside the box and they're really quite savvy. Um, as many of our students are graphic design majors or um, video and motion media majors, um, they're really quite savvy with the online environment. Um, they're, you know, they're creating animated movies for Pixar. So um, they're really quite savvy. But as far as um, online tools, you know, our institution has um, the typical um, Blackboard or Canvas sites. Um, we use Blackboard at SCAD. And so we're, we primarily use that. And now that we are in an online environment, um, we are, of course, learning as we go and incorporating even more online tools um, and resources for our students and our faculty. Um, I'm going to share one of my favorites, which is um, Padlet.com. And anybody who has a Pinterest page might be familiar with this one. Um, Padlet, I would say, is um, much more academic. Um, but it basically, Padlet is basically a wall. Um, that you can use to post anything to. Um, and um, how we use it in 
teaching and just the example you can see on the screen, um, I used it in this particular class, which was English for academic success. And it was a class that was very similar to a first year experience class. So um, one of the goals and the objectives of this course were, were for our students to become familiar with resources and um, events and different opportunities at SCAD. So um, one of the the activities were for my students to attend what I call um, and what SCAD calls extended learning opportunities. And so they had to attend these events, whether it be a fashion show or um, maybe it was a career and alumni success event, like a mock interview, or um, maybe it was a signature event from SCAD, like a presentation from an animator or a fashion um, designer. And they had to attend these events and then they would post about it um, on the Padlet page, including a visual. Um, and so Padlets, that was one way to, to kind of document the activities of our students with um, an ELO, an extended learning opportunity. Um, but it also gave them the opportunity to share these opportunities and resources at the institution. Um, and also, of course, they're practicing their writing skills at the same time. Um, but Padlet's really easy and it, it can be used in so many different ways. Um, it's, it's really easy for anybody who's um, new with online tools or somebody who's very savvy with online tools. Um, you basically just create your account and then you can create a board um, and they give you different options for backgrounds or the layout that you want. It can be just kind of a free form or you can choose a layout that's like a grid or a stream. Um, but it can be used in, in online classes in so many different ways. Um, it could be just a tool to, to give your class announcements, um, especially if you don't have an online um, system like a Blackboard or Canvas page. Um, mm -hmm. You can use it very often in brainstorming. Um, if you um, have a writing topic and you want your students to first discuss the topic or come up with ideas, they can all individually log on to their Padlet page and post their ideas and just start to brainstorm. Um, one thing I, I've always liked to do in um, listening and speaking classes, especially if you're taking, um, if you're teaching note taking skills, um, I always like to listen to something like, for example, a TED talk, and I might have, I might be taking notes at the same time as the students, um, just to kind of give them, you know, as you've taught these different note taking strategies. And um, this is another, you could use Padlet basically to kind of model how you're taking notes and then students could post their notes too, just to see um, the different formats and they can see if they are catching on to main ideas and if there's any way that they can be more concise with their note taking or whatnot. Um, you know, you could even use this for book club, um, you know, having discussions about, you know, an extended novel that you're reading maybe in class um, to get feedback. Um, I've, I've seen some students or some teachers use this for, um, portfolio work because um, you can you don't have it's not just a picture and a text you can also um, post links you can post videos um, pictures um, just about anything um, yeah and I, nice. I guess another another good way also is like I like to use this also as like an exit ticket so sometimes at the end of class I might ask my students so what did you learn today let's let's see um, just to kind of see how I'm doing and how they're learning at the same time so those are just a few ways that I like to use this tool. That sounds great. I mean, I, I personally never heard of it. I think it's wonderful, definitely. Um, yeah, Andy, do you, do you have any questions about, did you know about this uh, particular yeah. tool? Uh, well, I, yeah, I knew, I, I haven't used it and I've heard of it. Um, but uh, what I liked about that is it does remind me about just how, how lucky we are, it, albeit overwhelmed perhaps by what's out there, but how, the, the opportunities for collaboration online is certainly one of the ways in which, you know, uh, online uh, schooling and especially in the current situation that, for example, when, when um, uh, Alison mentioned book club there, I'm, as you know, very much involved in helping teachers and schools to develop reading, extensive reading, not, not reading skills per se in terms of you know, skin reading and scanning and comprehension, uh, far from it. It's more a case of reading easily for enjoyment, despite how reckless that sounds in curricula. And when, when she mentions collaboration tools like Padlet, a book club is a great way to take what would otherwise be reading online uh, and then in a community sense, 
sharing we, what we want in terms of readers, for example, with graded readers, if I was talking about that area, getting students not to just answer questions all the time because it becomes dull and it reduces their motivation, but we want them to respond to the stories. So I like that because my immediate reaction as an extensive reading guy would be, you know, to harness that to get students to respond to story that not, stories that not only they en enjoyed and understood, but really wanted to communicate about, which is what we want. And that would be a great tool, I think. Definitely, yeah, I think so as well. I think so as well. Well, thank you, Alison. Um, that sounds great. Uh, I will be jotting that one down. <laughs> Def <laughs> well, um, Andy, um, yeah. what is your favorite, um, what tools can you recommend? Well, um, I think the first uh, slide up is uh, the first of two that I'm going to show, or two particular um, items or concepts. I've gone straight for continuing professional development, CPD, because I think, you know, it, whilst before I go into any areas uh, of content that might be useful for teachers to be looking at, considering, I just think it might be useful for you know, it's, a, it's an opportunity, perhaps, despite the stress and, um, you know, time restrictions to, to, to move forwards, because not everybody out there has time to, you know, consider their options and read books and decorate their houses. People are now scrambling like crazy to try and get the best schooling they can for their kids and teens online. But there could be opportunities here to rethink how you teach, which is obviously what's happening by the nature of the situation and here is a magazine and I've just I just it's been going a long time but it's online as well digital or print and um, I don't work for them but I, so but I have in the past recommended it enormously and I still when I go to areas to just catch up with trends low low on the academic that's that's not an insult because they have a sister magazine or journal called modern English teacher which gives the, the, the more thorough articles. But I was thinking one of the things to recommend would be straightforward articles on any area of teaching for any age of students that teachers have, any, any caliber, new, experienced, whatever. This magazine, and it has, what I love, it's another slide there, thank you, is if you go to the, when you sign in, it costs to have access, but it's only about, I don't know, 30, forty dollars a year and you have access to thousands of articles going way back to the 90s when this magazine began and you can find and anything and what i love about magazines as we all know whether it's a, a professional magazine or it's something that you're like which is I don't know, films astronomy or cooking by nature of a magazine article you've got to be concise so when you're looking for how to teach online or how to tend drama activities you have to be concise and so i think when people are feeling, well, maybe I could spend some time discovering some new ideas and approaches. This is an area where I think it's great to go and look up something, um, find the latest magazine for sure and read through it, but also check out some, a lot of sharing out there, which is of course collated and curated by professionals. So this is a, a reliable source. That's what I'm saying as well. Sometimes there's a lot, out, a lot out there, but it's not necessarily um, kept, um, <clears throat> kept as a quality control. I want to mention also in terms of tech training, I think teachers might be feeling overwhelmed mm -hmm. with uh, what's out there in terms of how they can be better or even start uh, to become online teachers. And Russell Stannard is one of the best I've seen out there who simplifies these on his YouTube channel. So if people were to look at this website, teacher training videos, or go to Russell's YouTube channel, he does really sweet, soft, uh, soft uh, academic you know how to videos as you can see on areas of teaching online um, things that of course as you can see there are not ELT uh, quite the opposite he takes what um, like um, Alison was saying with Padlet he takes tech tools and shows how English teachers specifically English teachers he's an ELT guy on how to to use them so those are my two um, quick uh, heads up for either a person that you can follow another good guy out there he's not on a slide here if you want to follow recommendations for online materials uh, many people will know nick peachy uh, n-i-k uh, mm -hmm. his last name is spelled peachy as in the peach uh, the fruit with e-y on the end nick peachy and if anyone follows him on, on usually on linkedin uh, or twitter um, he is a constant source of, you know, not just um, online materials and tech tools, but also advice 
on uh, things he's, he's checked for himself. So teacher training, I think CPD might be a time to, you know, go to find some go-to places to figure out how you're going to teach online, given that it might be overwhelming. Um, what did I pick then for some ideas and materials? Um, now, I did used to work for these guys in the 2000s, and I had a great time because they're a magazine company, and you can't, you know, with teachers like using magazines. Uh, I picked this resource because um, what, uh, there's a lot of very good, um, a lot of very good online uh, programs out there for e-learning. But what's mm -hmm. often lacking, uh, although the many robust ones do keep adding, which can be also overwhelming, Mary Glasgow has a history of, um, you know, providing topical leveled materials. So you can read the news as a student or exploit it as a teacher at five levels. And this website is, again, it's a subscription website. You can have, you can certainly get you know, digital or print magazines as part of this. But what I also like for this for teachers is that, uh, if you go to the next uh, slide, when you subscribe, um, you can also see videos and audio. And uh, there's a resource area where, again, teachers can download uh, resources. Um, that's that particular download of resources is certainly thousands of worksheets that they could use when we all perhaps get back to the, the, the physical classroom. But the videos uh, are fantastic for teenagers. This is very much a secondary teachers area or upper primary at best. Um, and again, I've just recommended an ETP, the professional magazine and Mary Glasgow, really easy go to site, you sign in fast, it, it's again, this is about $40 a year for accessing thousands of uh, um, bits of material, it could be audio, it could be video, it could be worksheets. And I just think, you know, whilst people are maybe not even able to choose their platforms, they can still bring in something from the outside. And uh, this is all about the real world, which is something we all feel strongly about, how to connect. Uh, you know, these are graded materials, but it does its absolute best to make sure kids feel this is real. English has a purpose. It's not just a subject. It's a skill for the real world. There you go. Well, this is quite nice. I forgot this. And this is the key thing about the website. The main thing about Mary Glasgow is magazines, five times a year, five levels, digital and or print. But uh, on the website, and this is free, I think, some of it's not free, but I think the news is, you can read it at five levels. So if you look there on the, uh, something there about the hope, that's the rainbow picture over in the UK and other countries, kids are drawing pictures of the rainbow and putting them on their windows to symbolize hope and boosting morale. There, you'd go and visit that particular article and choose according to the levels between, uh, I think it's A2 and B1, C1 rather, which particular level you'd like to read. Next one um, would be, that's Mary Glasgow, real person, by the way, Mary Glasgow set it up in the 50s when she decided course books weren't quite doing it. <laughs> um, ready to run, um, I uh, was a consultant for this company uh, last year, and um, the reason I accepted the project with them is because their films, uh, video, and uh, which what teacher or you know content provider doesn't like to use video uh but this one really does um help teachers because it's another listen you're talking about underrepresented skills earlier in the questions underrepresented skill underrepresented skill would mean for me in particular authentic materials and that's such a dangerous area for some people you'd think unless it's supported well uh and this ready to run is a collection of about 80 and growing documentaries uh, at graded, graded, which is brilliant because when I've said to people in the past, these are graded real documentaries, people wonder how they can be graded. And the, and the secret is, and they won an award for this from the British Council last year, the, the two owners are ex-BBC production guys who taught themselves in three years all about ELT and what students and schools needed. And with their editorial skills, TV editorial, would cut into documentaries, not just to cut them down to about four or five minutes, but also to literally take out anything that did not fit the level according to the Common European Framework. So in other words, yes, you have a seamless uh, documentary narrative up through levels up to B2 of real people talking about real things, not scripted actors. And that's a really hard thing to pull off. And I think that's really great to see more video content out there used wisely, not too many scripted videos so ready to run and as i've been speaking my email uh is there throughout these slides all of these um 
different content uh, materials have got uh, various uh, coronavirus um, uh, free access uh, it, it the trial well it's a trial codes that can allow people to try things for the period of uh, um, lockdown that teachers are in Mm -hmm. And then finally, Picaro World, which is something that I um, I think is a, a terrific resource where we're looking at the way schools connect with home. And I picked this one because this is a very strong contender for how homeschooling can, you know, be married up with uh, the, the, the schools in their own ways, trying to link schools with home. So it's very much a sort of, it's a sort of 16, about 16 books. I think it's four levels. Four, four books at each level, online or, or print, but comes with fantastic games. And so if there are teachers and students out there looking for games, you can subscribe just to the games. I think there are about nearly a thousand language topic-based games used independently or with the course. And um, I think what I like about all these things is I, I've tried to choose things which were either for teachers to find some guidance, Russell or the English teaching professional or Nick Peachy, but also perhaps here, you know things which provide a lot of fun because I think there's a there's a danger here everyone I don't know, feeling under pressure to keep performing as a school to give still the quality of schooling that people expect but we have to remember that it's tough uh, the kids are struggling no one knows for sure uh, how this will play out from a pedagogic point of view we're doing our best so I thought I'd throw in some things which make the learning fun and uh, accessible and this is literally one that is based on gamified learning for primary and in, in, in fact preschool as well because keeping kids meaningfully occupied uh, is quite tough i uh, went on for a bit there thank you for moving the slide but there's, there <laughs> no, is a lot no, no worries Andy. Well, that's a, all a lot of great information yeah and, there's, uh, there's also, a lot Allison, great, resources. great resources so in the few minutes that we do have remaining and i want to uh, extend apologies chris is not able to join us today um we were hoping to have him share his perspective um, but due to technical difficulties, that is, he's not going to be able to join us. So um, we are going to go ahead and in the few minutes that we do have remaining, um, we will go ahead and, um, oh, I'm sorry, Walter, you had these um, in here about sounds of speech. Do you want to touch on this really quickly? Um, yes, I just thought I would throw in uh, one of my favorites. It's an old goodie uh, that um, you may be most people may be familiar with. But the whole sort of uh, concept is practicing sounds of speech. This is for American speech in isolation. Because sometimes in classes we don't have, you know, because of class time restraints, we don't have enough time to practice pronunciation. Usually it's just something where students are asked to listen and then repeat. Um, but this particular site, which does not have a cost, um, allows the students to work independently um, and it allows them to practice sounds of speech in isolations. Um, so this is, this is really good. Uh, and here's an example of the letter H, which does not exist. As we know, the vowels and consonants don't exist in every single language. In English, there's some that we have in other languages they do not exist. And I think our foreign students struggle with these things. Um, and here is a tool where they can go and actually learn how to, they can listen to it and they can learn how to produce the sounds by an animated um, um, image here with the sound and also their step-by-step -step descriptions as well. I've used it personally to work on my Spanish R's and uh, the French R's uh, and things of that nature, but I think it's a really, really good too. So. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that, Walter. Um, now, um, and I know we're running a little bit over and I thank everybody for remaining on. Um, we do want to get to a few of your questions. So uh, the microphones will continue to be muted. Um, and if you have any questions during this time, you can enter them into the panel. And again, if we don't have an opportunity to answer them, we will reach out to you uh, offline with those answers. Um, so with that, let's uh, turn to some of the questions that we have received. Walter, okay. what do we have? We've got here, let's see, da, da, da. Um, how can I motivate my students to explore these online resources? That's a question for you, for you, Allison, and for, for Andy. How do you motivate the students to actually go there? Um, go ahead, Allison, you, you, you go first. Um, I think, you know, 
part of it is just being realistic with the students at this point. Um, they're, they're, the idea with learning a language is to communicate and they're not out there. They're, you know, especially if they were in the States or um, in another country where um, English is the language, um, they're not able to do that as much. So we have to really kind of push them and tell them that, you know, the, there are resources available and you're not getting the same exposure, I think, as they would um, if we were not in this um, environment with COVID-19. So we really have to kind of teach them these tools and just keep trying to motivate them to use them because they're not getting the same amount of practice or exposure in the situation that we are in. Um, you know, for example, and, and Walter just shared the tool um, with the, um, the phonetics and the moving of the mouth. And it's, it's funny because I had a teacher the other day and I was observing her class online and I can see her, you know, putting her face really close to the camera and trying to show students the movement of the mouth and the lips um, in order to produce these sounds. But, you know, that class is over and they saw the teacher do it. But, you know, our students might need to go back to that. Maybe they have a pronunciation journal assignment where they have to produce those sounds and maybe they can't remember the teacher if she didn't record her lesson. You know, she, they, they're going to have to go back and use these tools. So I think um, the way that teachers are designing the assignments, um, mm -hmm. which kind of encourage them to use these tools, encourage students to, to really try to have some sort of authentic practice as, a, as authentic as we can make it in this situation. Um, I think that's, that's how you need to motivate them. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, from my side, I would, uh, yeah, I'd add to that by saying, I mean, it's funny, uh, the, the last series of uh, tours I was on, uh, actually, this is in Mexico and Central America in the last part of last year before we all stayed at home uh, soon after, was that I was doing workshops on motivating uh, secondary teachers or getting them to motivate their students. And I was, I give them quite a few tasks to ask the students in different ways ask the students what they'd like to do. Now, I don't mean it quite so openly, but for example, when it comes to topics or books or uh, particular um, activity types, ask them, kind of get to know them. Maybe there's a way now with, you know, different either closed community groups or the way that the schools are communicating with their classes is asking the students what they'd like more of, that they enjoy, you know, if it is an exploratory time, Maybe there's a there's space in the week for students to send in the sort of things that they've seen others talking about or liking or using, or maybe a vote they could set up with maybe, um, I don't know, what is it, Quizlet, perhaps? Uh, no, Kahoot, a sort of survey of things. Try and do a little survey. Kids love surveys. I mean, teens, I mean kids as well. Right. Could we get a survey from them of what they'd like to do more of? And I suppose also when you do choose things is make the task really clear. Sometimes they don't do it because they just don't feel they know what to do. Um, so if it's motivating them to see new things, you know, maybe that might be a way of asking them to explore some things on your behalf and see them, see if they can vote, give them some sense of control over what's going on. They must feel pretty overwhelmed and pinned down with tasks. <laughs> that, that's a great point, Andy. Uh, thank you for sharing that. We have time for one more question. Walter, what do we have? Um, let's see here. This is a little, um, oh, this is different. This is a little surprising. Um, do any of these online resources that you recommend, um, do, do they practice American English, British English, or another variety? If so, it's, does it really matter what the resources, what type of English these resources use? Uh, okay, I'll come in because I showed some resources. Uh, in the case of um, the Mary Glasgow materials are British English. Uh, I think they do some American English, but it's very British English, I would say. Um, though the topics, I have to say, are, you know, very international. So you may well read about Beyonce or, you know, football stars, which is crucial because it's all about teen topics. It'll be in British English. Ready to run, uh, non-native speakers competent non-native speakers and American English, as well as British in those documentaries. And Picaro World is in either British or American English. Okay, okay. Does it, do you, do you think, Allison, that it makes a difference what the, the sources are? I mean, so as I, are practicing, what do you think? Oh, it's a whole webinar, isn't it? Brilliant, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I primarily work with university students and students who, um, you know, are 
most of them want to try to get an IELTS or TOEFL score so that they don't have to be in an ESL program. And, and I know both of those tests, many of the standardized um, tests for admissions have both varieties, have British English, American English, Australian English. So, um, and I always tell my students, it's kind of that same speech, um, you know, my students who say, I want to get rid of my accent. And I always kind of give them that speech Aww. of, well, you know what? There are so many, there's more people in the world speaking English as a second or third or fourth yeah. language than there are speaking a first language. And, and what is important is, you know, learning negotiation of meaning and being able to make yourself understood. Um, and so I honestly don't really think that that is as important in my personal opinion. I agree with that too. And so as a teacher, certainly, uh, so I was just advising on something recently and unfortunately I had to advise this company that it has to be in British English in, in, in European state schools and probably private schools as well uh, because it's just a curriculum thing you know and that's when it comes to uh, some of the material that's on you know in audio and, vi and vi video that they want to see British English as a model because in, in many markets in Europe they want that and that's the only reason that it comes up as a as a deal breaker in terms of adopting material. But yeah, in fact, bring on more, and publishers do, you know, more and more non-native speakers are in the audio, even if they've been kind of impersonated. That's, be that's at least a start, instead of assuming that everyone produces the best, whatever British English is, I mean, or American English. Um, exactly. But yeah. it's true, yeah. Okay, great, great, fantastic. Well, thank you. I mean, and Nicole, do we have time for, should we move on to, um, what is our time standing here? <laughs> um, well, I'm, I, I got to say our audience is hanging in pretty strong. So if we do want to tackle one final brief question, we certainly can. Um, I'm still, I, I'm good. I'm happy. I'm good I'm too. happy as well. Yeah, yeah. I think we I like happy people. panelists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think yeah. we've covered, I'm looking at the questions that have come in, and I think we've touched on uh, things about costs for websites, whether they're free, how much they are, and the diversity of our ELT or ELLs to yeah. populations. I mean, that, that pretty much runs the whole gamut of um, everyone that we have contact yeah. with. And the age ranges as well, we've um, addressed those. So I think that all of the sites that we recommended or the tools could be applied to to any age group um, um, here's a question um, there is one from a parent who wants to know how they can use some tools like that to help their students their children um, practice English but I suppose that could be the same thing I mean they could have access to these things and, and they could yes. 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 Uh, well, the ones I mentioned, if anyone wants to contact me, I can give them access to try things for at least 30 days. No obligation. It's just, uh, as I said earlier, not just a trial to see it. But in most cases, because of the coronavirus uh, period of lockdown, a lot of these things are available for free just to help people out, parents and schools. And, you know, I just want to add in case, you know, we do run out of time. And the one thing I'd say to anyone out there as a parent or a, or a teacher of any of any kind of age or level it's just you know um we we're all everyone's doing their best and i think to to remember that it's just let's keep it you know let's just think about what's really needed you know that it may not be perfect but you know it in the end you may we may never know exactly what's all out there in terms of online content it's like buying a, a smartphone or a computer even even when it all started you, you will you never really know if you bought the right thing because there's so much choice there's a great ted talk by Barry Schwartz, if you look at it, one of the most popular ones out there, Barry Schwartz uh, on, I think something to do with the burden of choice about mm -hmm. how we never feel we've chosen the right thing. It's a paradox of choice, that's it. Paradox of choice, it's only like you know, 20 minutes. And he talks about, you know, there's so much choice, you never feel like you've got the right thing. Well, maybe you do. What is it your child and your, your classes, pick out three or four things you need for that lesson and let it be okay, let it be enough. You'll never be the perfect thing anyway. Sometimes you just got to dive in, make a choice and see how it goes. And I, I think, you know, we have to be good to ourselves and know that, you know, it's always going to keep changing. So what do you need? Focus it down to two or three things, four things maximum. And the burden of choice will make us feel it's never the right one. Good luck, I'd say. We're all, we're all there to help. We're all there to help. There's plenty of ideas to share. 
<laughs> yes, there is. And I want to thank both you and Allison for sharing your ideas. I think there's a lot of great resources here and we will be sharing this presentation out to everybody who joined us today. So uh, you'll be able to link through to the various resources that Allison and Andy were showing. Um, and I'm going to see if I can grab some of the other ones that they mentioned, you know, so that we can pass those through along to you as well. Um, so um, with that, we are running low on time. And um, again, I just hope everybody found this uh, session to be informative. And um, just want to remind everybody, you know, that's more on the content development side. If there is anyone here from that stream that we are here to help you with your projects and you can visit our website westchestereducationservices.com to learn more about that and you can also reach out to me by email um, with any questions or comments that you have regarding today's webinar or if you're interested in hearing uh, about other topics that we might consider so uh, once again i want to thank our panelists i want to cool. thank walter for moderating this discussion and i hope you all enjoy the rest of your day thank you Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thank you Thank Westchester. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Alice and Nicole. You have a good day. Keep in touch. Bye-bye. Well, bye-bye. Bye-bye, Alison. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.